Hi, you're listening to Good Is In The Details podcast. I'm Gwendolyn Dolsky, and with me today, guest hosting is filmmaker, writer, gadfly, Jacob Weber. Ahoy. <laughs> you ready to talk infrastructure? I'm ready to ask infrastructure. Okay, that works. And our guest today is infrastructure expert, LA lawyer, transportation consultant for Wisco Weekly, and is on the podcast Deliberations, Rudy Sallow. Hi, hey. good, good afternoon. How are you? How are you doing? <laughs> I got to. I got to say, you. Did I, oh. You know, you did great, but you look incredibly uncomfortable with that microphone in front of you. Is there? Should we make any adjustments? There? <laughs> Do not look behind the curtain. I, mean, I kind of want to take a picture right here. I think the reason I look uncomfortable is I've. I'm trying to keep my nose in contact. I with see that. The, yeah. I see that. Only it's because just, you told me before we started recording that I sounded good in this position. I'm trying to keep... <laughs> a, but you I, have to hold it. But, but I don't want you to be hurt. I don't want you to... Like, don't move. <laughs> yeah. That's totally... I appreciate you pointing that out. I can <laughs> I can try and relax now. I apologize if I was making you uncomfortable. No, no, no. I just yeah. I care about my guests oh, uh, and, my, and, my, and my law firm. So I want to make sure, you know, whatever I can do to help you. Um, I'm going to relax now. <laughs> Okay, let's get into it. What is, let's say, what is something that is specific about LA infrastructure that we can learn today? What makes LA unique when it comes to the infrastructure issues? I, I think LA is unique. I mean, there's a, literally a billion things that makes Los Angeles unique in, a, in its infrastructure and its transportation system. Some, an interesting fact that most people don't know about, uh, maybe a fair amount of people know about it, especially if they've ever seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit is right now we're probably going through our second rendition of let's just call it streetcars, trolleys, you know, trains. I mean, back around the turn of the century, not this century, but you know, last century, um, you know, the 1900s into about 1940s to 1950s or 60s, we actually had a full-blown transportation system here in Los Angeles. That transportation system was owned and operated primarily by the developers. You had these railroad companies, you know, the Huntingtons, everybody else, and they, once they built out all the railroads, they were thinking, well, there's a lot of great land out here. Let's let's sell some people some land. So they had this transportation system. It was otherwise known as the, the, the red car or the red car trolley system, and it was spread out. The city was sp spread out. Los Angeles did not necessarily become the suburb that it is because of the automobile. Los Angeles kind of started out as a, as a spread out suburb because of the if you go and look at the history of the layout of of the red car it made it easy for people to live in these outlying areas and come into central downtown or to go to other parts of Los Angeles so we were kind of set up spread out and now we're now things are moving back more in downtown centralized focus with with the second wave if you will of our of the trains and subways and light car light rail that's being built out today well one of the interesting things for me is that we take it for granted you know getting on the road or how we go somewhere forgetting that our entire concept of transportation or how you get from point a to point b is a structure that is built before you so you've actually bought into a system that you had no part in designing you see what i mean like if you think that well for example like in chicago when i was just visiting some friends and I said, well, can we drive or take the train? And they immediately said, the train just makes way more sense. It was just so obvious to them, but it wasn't an obvious answer to me. Well, that's because that's because of where you and I grew up. See, where you and I grew up uh, down in Orange County, we, we, there only, we only got around primarily using the car. I, I happened to also get around and had an, a, a major impact on my life. I had a grandmother that immigrated here that didn't have a driver's license, and she lived with us, and she liked to you know go out and – you know, not just stay home all day. So she learned the bus system. So from a very young age, I learned how to use my two feet and the bus system down in Orange County to to get around. So so growing up, I knew that there were other options besides the car. The vast majority of people that you and I grew up with mm -hmm. only know the car, and they yeah. still to this day, Gwen, still only know the car. Yeah. Well, this was so. This was an issue. This is actually something that came up on Wisco Weekly when there was this discussion about you know, what is the freedom? And you made the point that when you take public transportation, you know exactly when you are going to arrive somewhere. So the idea of hopping in your car, you don't actually know when you're going to get somewhere with the way that our transportation is set up now. So we Except think about- that's shifting, courtesy of GPS, all GPS oh, platforms yeah. offering ETA now. Yeah. Which, I don't, yeah. You're 100% correct, which typically if you're in a car or, or even if you're in a bus, Gwen, mm -hmm. uh, can be affected if, a, if an accident happens while, while you're driving. So 
other than when you're on a train, you pretty much you can live and die by that schedule. That is the one difference right. I would say. Hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to offer a roadblock to your. No, well, I mean, there's, well, I think it's interesting because when we think about cars, we think about advertisements that are all, they'll take place in Arizona, you know, the open road, they're selling this notion of freedom. You don't see a car commercial on the 405 in traffic, right? It just wouldn't work. <laughs> no. But that's the, that's the reality of it. And yet, so we're buying into this idea of freedom. And there's, I think that there's still this idea that public transportation is the opposite of freedom it's not actually allowing for freedom and i'm wondering if that's some of the mind shift that needs to happen great question there's a lot of mindset shifts that need to happen and w one thing that i'm trying to do and to get people to think about public transportation differently and to how to get around differently is to divorce the concept of getting to and from work or to and from school from the actual pleasure of driving okay so my favorite vacation besides Las Vegas, my favorite vacation is actually a road trip. I love road trips. I dream about road trips. I write about road trips. I purposely will go out of my way in primarily in California and go take a brand new road that I've never been on just to see something different. But that's pleasure. Commuting sucks. Okay. Monday to Friday, getting to and from work, to and from school. There's no, if you have the option to get to and from your school or your work, other than your car, you should be doing that. Because guess what? You can get more work done, or mm -hmm. you can write a book, or you can write a movie, or you can watch Netflix. That's freedom to me. That's the type of, that to me is the definition of freedom because you're getting back hours of your day to have more time to do things that, that you should be doing. Let somebody else drive for you. There, there are, most cities have bus lines or transit lines or van pools going to and from where most people work. So yeah. explore those and, and you'll get time back. And to me, the most valuable thing on earth is not money. And even in Southern California, it's not real estate, it's time. And, and you, you cannot create time, so you're going to have to reallocate your time. So is it on the city to counter these advertisements from the automotive automobile companies with who who's going to draw uh, who's going to change the minds where's the money and the effort going to come from to get out the campaign that tells potential commuters uh, you can do all of the things that you just mentioned you can read you the choice is to be found on a, a subway car as opposed to behind the wheelie of your automobile. I don't think it's on the cities. The cities the cities and the county and the transit agencies, their primary job is to run and operate these um, and finance. That's that's my day job. I, f I help them finance these facilities and to make sure that they're run safely and that they run as on time as possible. I think it's incumbent upon people like me to get out of my car and to tell people all of the things that I've been able to do with my life and all the health benefits and the money benefits it's it's the writers, okay? I think I, th I think as a transit writer, um, I have a duty to tell other people like, here are all the things that you can do, and oh by the way, if you need any help, just give me a call, send me a send me a tweet. Like people like my sister and my cousins and my family members and friends and coworkers constantly email me and call me and say, hey, I need to go from here to here. How do I do that? I help them. I mean, the cities are already overstretched. And I know how overstretched they are because I do infrastructure finance. And infrastructure finance, the only way that the vast majority of our infrastructure gets built is by these finite revenue sources. And cities and counties and school districts and everything, they're already constrained with how they can raise revenue. So, you know, I, I think we need, all need to be good citizens and, and get the message out out there. And so that's one of the reasons why I do go and I go on to podcasts. That's why I am the transportation correspondent on Whiskey Weekly. It's why I am a guest speaker at Busted um, every every several months. I, I think it's I think it's a part of, you know, being being a human and living in LA. Get get people out of the car. Yeah, people who are not from LA, they are from other big cities, they don't like it at all because they say they can't get around, right? As opposed to New York. It is so different. I mean I, I was in New York for a decade and change and I would, the first thing that someone told me when I came out to L.A. was don't ride the bus. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It, it literally said people don't ride the bus unless you're riding to a job as a landscaper or a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. um, it's socioeconomically, it's a completely different picture. Yeah. You've got every class of people in a lot of major cities here. You just have the working class on the bus. Yeah. I mean, it, there's. Here in Los By the way, that was a totally obnoxious thing to say. No, 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 no. You, you were quoting what somebody told you. You weren't quoting what you said. And you know what? I hear that all the time, and a lot of people think that. 
there are different types of buses in Los Angeles. Okay, so the so I take two buses. One of the buses that I take if I'm if I'm able to get out of the house on time is called the Commuter Express. It's put on by the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. It's not everywhere in the city, but it pretty much goes to from where a lot of people live to the downtown core and even on some places in the west side. This bus is like a luxury bus. Reclining seats, Wi-Fi, two bucks and fifty cents, totally clean. It is the I hate to say it, the white collar bus, okay? Commuter Express, that's just what it is. There are other types of buses that go through areas of town that, you know, traditionally have lower to, you know, middle income earners. And unfortunately for those people, they don't have the luxury bus. That's too bad, and they probably should. But in any event, they do they do have bus service through through those areas. Another bus that I take is actually a part of uh, the LA Metro line. It's called the Silver Line. So right where the 110 and the 105 freeway meet, you you get off of the green line and you actually go in the middle of the freeway. Like no joke. Right, you walk in the middle between these two double deckers. There's these stairs and there's an elevator. You go right down to the floor of the freeway and there's a bus lane. It's called the Silver Line that just goes up and down from down in San Pedro all the way up through downtown Los Angeles. And- Does it go out to Pasadena or is that that's another line. Uh, I think it goes to El Monte. If okay. I if I think it, I think it stops in El Monte. So it's it's pretty it's a pretty incredible line, and that's that's a bus, and that goes through every single type of neighborhood you could think of. Hmm. I want to, this is something that's slightly different. Um, you had mentioned the congestion tax. Congestion pricing. Congestion pricing. Okay, yes. can you tell us what that is? Yeah, sure. Uh, congestion pricing is something that is um, has not heard of been. This? Uh, yeah, they they're they're just introducing it in New York. They have it. In, oh, okay, in, all right. Uh, Florence and yeah, they congestion pricing is basically um, for big, large uh, downtown centers where there's just massive amounts of traffic and um, cities are having a problem getting people off of the roads and, and using other alternatives. They they institute something called congestion pricing. Think of it as like like another type of toll. In order to drive into a downtown area, you have to pay a fee. They've instituted it in London since the early 2000s. They have it in Singapore, and I believe they also have it in Stockholm. So those are the only three cities in the world that have it currently. New York was the first city in the United States to decide to use it, and it's going to come into play, I believe, in 2021, whereby people um, entering into Manhattan south of 61st Street are going to have to pay a fee, uh, basically, in order in order to enter it. Probably makes sense in a place like New York. New York has probably one of the best public transit uh built out public transit um in the entire country la is a lot better than what it used to be it only really in its most recent rendition it only started to get financed in the 1980s and then it didn't really come into play until the late 80s and the early 90s and it's still building out so it does in my opinion if you're going to have congestion pricing you need to have all, all mass amounts of alternatives built out so people can so people can you know, not use their cars. I mean, you, depending upon where you live in LA, you can get to and from downtown no problem using using a train or a train or a bus. But it's but it's we're not quite there yet. So New York, in my opinion, makes makes the most amount of sense. Because the first thing I thought of is what about people who can't afford it? Because that's nothing for people who can't afford it. But what if you really are trying to make ends meet? That seems so unfair. They um, as a part of the congestion pricing that uh, the LA Metro board is currently considering, the, uh, part of the funding that they're considering. So like the people that can afford it. There's going to be a way for the people that can't afford it to not have to pay it. Like they, okay. that's that's a part of the that's part of the plan. Oh, the same okay. thing in New York. There there that's 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 a part of it as well. There is something that you that you wrote. I'm interested in. It's the role of government finance professionals in coming transportation revolution. Yes. Um, well, yes. what I circled what I circled here was <laughs> that just you um, you said our dangerous addiction to personal vehicles. So that's those are strong words. They, they, what they, do you mean by that? A dangerous addiction. They. Um, I, th- those are strong words, but I'm starting to hear a lot more people people use that line. The cars are killing us. You know, the war on cars. I do think that we as a society um, are dangerously addicted to personal vehicles. In fact, for the last 70 years, the vast majority of our infrastructure in this country has been financed and built out with one mode of transportation in mind, and that's the personal vehicle. Cars are inherently dangerous. Let's just let's just be honest. Like it. Yes, 40,000 to 40,000 people a year die in the United States every year from, from car accidents. It's amazing it's not more than that. I mean, we, we have a lot more safety features and, you know, we've got seat belts and people are people are driving better and we do have, you know, some, some computer and AI in cars. But 
driving is dangerous and it's unhealthy. Driving is unhealthy. I, I think uh, a lot of the obesity that we have in this country, I think a lot of the health problems that we have in this country is because we've stopped walking. Walking is like the easiest form of exercise on earth. So I've got, I've got two little kids at home, so I can't go to the gym as much as I want to. So I've, I've had to make adjustments to my schedule in order to like get some exercise. One of the ways that I do that is I don't really drive that much. And when I do not drive, I'll get dropped off like a couple of bus stops down uh, and I'll walk. Like I, I think cars um, are also dangerous because they, you take a lot of time away from, from, from something that you don't have to do. Like if you have an option to not drive, don't drive and do something better, like read or watch a TV show or something. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's extraordinary to sometimes when I'm with people and they're just really fighting to get the closest parking spot somewhere. It's just, it's extraordinary. I'm just like, you can't you walk. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> you you kind of look silent. guilty. Didn't you look a little guilty like, there? I was just thinking about the, <laughs> the, that in those altercations, the rage that people feel, the, the whole notion of road rage plays into yeah. that same idea of the, the lack of health behind, you know, that, and it further alienates us from each other. So there's a, a another layer of mental health that's compromised by getting behind the car. I, I like the, the personal vehicle addiction. I'm ready to do some step work. Uh, <laughs> I should, I should, PVA, I come, hey, PV Anonymous. That's a great idea. I didn't even think of co- like coming up with a twelve step program, yeah, man. We listen, should do that. Yeah. We should come up with the. We should. We could. We could be like you know, like uh, like like saints to people. You know, they'll they'll revere us for for generations. I well, it sounds like that's what you're already in the process of doing. I, I, there's something saintly about the work that you're doing. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I'm hoping it'll it'll get me, um, um, you know, w- one notch or two down in the level of purgatory that I'm guaranteed to go into. <laughs> but I, you know, from your from your mouth to God's ears, I've spoken to the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that even the setup you had talked about the setup of the freeway in California. How maybe give us a bit of a history of what was what was envisioned there, and then what has happened today? Because there used to be a time where if you got on the road, you knew there was going to be traffic. That does not seem to exist anymore. It does not seem to matter what time of day I get on the freeway, I'm going to be in traffic. So how did the initial idea of a freeway, what was that offering? And then what has happened now? Actually, the very first freeway freeway in the entire country is right here, right, in, right next to downtown LA. It was called the Arroyo Seco, uh, which is now the 110 freeway, connecting downtown uh, Los Angeles to... Pasadena. Um, was that Robert Moses? I, it, it might be. I, you know, it's it's, it's crazy because I actually, I've actually, I actually wrote like a little like blog post on the history of uh, of the freeway here. Honestly, one of the most important things to know about the history of the freeway in Los Angeles is that word "freeway." Yeah. Uh. It's the free that would that is going to take some years and undoing and some mindset shifting because. When you start talking about congestion pricing, when you start talking about the express lanes, when you start talking about making it harder for people to just you know jump in their car anytime they want to and go from here to there and, and trying to push people to use o- other alternative options, we grew up with this idea that it's the freeway. It's supposed to be for free. Like I already paid my tax dollars and it's mine. It's it, I, Nobody's going to make me pay for it. Okay. That is inherent in every single person that is in that is in Los Angeles. So just that word freeway is something that we all need to start like speaking differently about it. And the reality is, is it's not free because it's sucking up a lot of time. I mean, because you're you're right. You hit the nail on the head. Add fifteen to twenty minutes minimum. No, no, unless you're driving in between the hours of eleven p.m. and like four a.m., you better add fifteen to twenty minutes, no matter where you're going in Los Angeles. If not an hour to an hour and a half. Which is crazy. Think about the amount of time, the amount of money that is that is wasted because we're all in these little, you know, four wheeled coffins going going to places. Well, it was how I started listening to podcasts. <laughs> That's how, that was a good point. I, I got to say that earlier. That's I, I the had one to get, redeeming yeah, thing. It is, isn't it? Because yeah. I taught a Me class too, at man. Loyola, which is right by LAX. And from Pasadena to Loyola, there's times I would spend nearly two hours just to get there. And it's only about 30 miles. So about two hours. And then the two hours to get back it's, home. But to be fair, you could be Let's listening see. to that podcast in a train, on a boat. 
This is true. Well, that's the thing like, that there's been this byproduct where I think one of the things from from when I lived in I lived in Belgium in grad school, and so I took the train everywhere, and I loved being able to read on the train. And coming back here, I find myself actually just terribly angry about the amount of time I'm spending in the car because it just feels like my hands are busy and it's just it's just gone it's just gone so one of the things that I guess a lot of people have been feeling the market tapped into that and that's how audiobooks and podcasts I think really took off I, I couldn't agree more for some reason I like to listen to podcasts as I'm driving like I'm obsessed with productivity and I'm obsessed with and we talked a little bit earlier and joking around about how like I'm this crazy multitasker and I'm trying to tone it down. However, if I'm driving, there's only one thing I want to do while I'm driving that I want to do. Sometimes I get stuck on a, like a conference call or something for work. I want to learn while I'm driving. So either I'm listening to a podcast or I'm listening to like an audio book. I really like the Audible like a lesson um, they have these like these lessons in history that you could you could download on them and I I've learned a lot. So if I am driving, which I try not to do, I want to make that time as useful as humanly possible. But let me, where do you, you, you live in Pasadena. Uh-huh. So you do, you, how close do you live to the gold line? Not that close. Well, well, hold on, hold on a second, wait, 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 hold on a second. I didn't know, because I know wait, where yeah, it is if is, I drive there. Where, wait, where exactly do you live? You know what, I did not agree to this. No, 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 you, this is, no, 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 this is what I do, I change, I, think I change people's view. Center. Where, where do you live by? I think it's, no, no, not me, but I think it's by the town hall. I know that that's because I walked past it, but normally when I go into Old Pass, there's a place where I park and then walk around. But I don't think that I, I am definitely by the bus system, but I don't think I'm by. This is what I want you to do. Uh -oh. But before the next time I talk to you, I want you totally to. Totally didn't agree to this. I could actually find out where I could, if I, you gave me your address, I could type on the phone. I could find out how close that Metro stop is. Cause if it's, if it's less than a 20 minute walk and you're not using it, then that is really disappointing. I think that's a great I line for the bars. I will not call the Pope. Your <laughs> I think that's you know, you can use any. You can use your iPhone and and uh, get directions oh, yeah. the next time you have to go somewhere and use. I think public transportation is an option along with walking. One hundred percent. You're absolutely right. That is a part of that is a part of Google uh, and I believe in Apple as well. If you're fortunate enough to live. Uh, at one of the test pilot areas, the LA Metro has a, they test piloted with this, with a ride share company called Via. And Via basically picks up, like, a, it's almost like a, think about it, almost like a little mini bus system whereby you will share a car with like two or three other people and you'll, you'll be dropped off to the, the end of a metro line. So they are implementing, LA Metro is implementing these, these ways to solve the first mile, last mile problem. And the reason why I brought up that whole 20 minute thing is one of the major problems in transit, especially here in Los Angeles as well as, well, well as elsewhere, is if you live more than a mile away from the transit stop, the chances of you actually walking and getting to and from it mm -hmm. is a major problem. People are like, just forget it, I'll just drive. So solving that first mile, last mile problem is one of the major reasons why you see the explosion of micro mobility options like scooters and like e-bikes. That's the reason why those have exploded over the last couple of years is because people do want to use the transit system. It's just they don't live close enough to it. But that's where these new options are out there, which is fantastic. Like some people ask me like, oh, how do you feel about these scooters and everything? I'm like, well, I'm pretty uncoordinated. I'm not really going to use them, but I'm glad other people are because most of the people are, most people are using them to go to and from transit stops. And some people are using them because there isn't even a transit option there. So at least they're not driving, but that, I mean, have you looked into scooters in Pasadena? Are scooters allowed no. in Pasadena? I do walk a lot, though. I walk everywhere. That's good. That's good. I didn't mean to put you on the hot no, seat. That's like, oh, sure you didn't. Yes, <laughs> no, I did. I, I, the, I, I did do that. But I, um, no, I'm in the habit of walking a lot. And I think it's funny because people, I mean, we're in Southern California. I don't see many people just walking about. So when I have more time, I'll walk to the grocery store, just have my backpack, and then fill it up. And then walk back, and now people in town know me. They'll be like, "Oh, hey, professor, I saw you walking." It, it, isn't that nice? Yeah. Isn't it nice to be and to it's be so, known? It's it's a nice, it's a lovely way to spend some time. You know, it's especially when I read and I write so much, and I need to get out, and I think, okay, I need to go to the grocery store. I may as well just walk there. And it's I don't know. It's just human, nice. It's very human. I, I that was one of the first. The thing that shocked me first was people's reaction when I first came out to L.A. If I had a lunch appointment somewhere like in West Hollywood and I was staying at a hotel in Beverly Hills or somewhere for even further west and I would walk, the the confusion on people's faces when I told them I had walked to lunch, 
I, it, you know, it really, it reminds me of the Californian sketch on SNL. The people oh, are yeah. so deeply entrenched in this idea of driving and navigating traffic. It's ironic that n- that it's such a stigma or seen as so peculiar to, to walk. I mean, the great 80s, I'm talking about 80s junkie, like literally junkie. I mean, missing persons, right? Walking in L.A. Nobody walks in L.A. Walking in L.A. <laughs> I mean, it, it it's true. I mean, Bands in the 80s used to write songs about that, but that's not true anymore. People are riding scooters in L.A. at least. They, at least th- things are starting to it's Starting change. to move. I, I, I'm thinking of it because right before I came here, I walked to my kid's school from where I had parked and just wanted to say a quick hi to them. And it was like I was breaking into the place. The security guards didn't know what to do. <laughs> so there you're was, on your two feet. What are you doing? There was no, literally, there was no apparatus. There was no entrance, human like door to go through. I had to enter the parking garage like a car, be- get in line behind the car in front of me. It was very strange. I realized this is insane. There's no way in LA to get to my kid's school without a. I, I don't know. To me, that still speaks of a, a system very entrenched in. Uh, no, you're right. It, yeah. it go, goes back to what Gwen was saying, and, and and on the podcast that I'm on, the Wisco Weekly podcast, where I serve as a transportation correspondent, we had one of the world's most expert in like transportation design, Jeff Wardle. He actually had a TED talk, like talk about like the design elements, like what's going to be the future, like why, wh- who should, who should these these city officials and these transportation officials and these car companies, who should they be engaging early on to effectuate and maximize efficiency and changes it's the designers like something like yeah and maybe you could you could have a door so a parent can like walk through it instead of having to walk through a parking garage like that's terrible design but that was la man that's that's the way it has been for ever since they decided to go all in they put all their chips in on the personal vehicle everything's been designed that way finally things are starting to change I think there's a part of uh, the L.A. commute that we just accept the traffic, that the idea that there is an alternative is just doesn't have as much of a presence as need be. That's partly what I'm thinking. You mean literally people can't conceive of it? Right. They're like, oh, I have to do an hour. It's going to take two hours. And they just accept that fate and then and do that instead of maybe get involved and say, what are the other possibilities? You're absolutely right, and that's thank and, you. And, no, you are, <laughs> and that's and that's why I swear that's the reason why I write these articles, why I do the podcast, why I why I tweet, while I while I take little videos. It really is because I'm just trying to say, hey, there is another way. Like I swear, there's there's there, if you just think about, even if you have to use something like taking Uber or Lyft to a transit stop, like paying five bucks, four bucks, three bucks. Just to get to someplace, there is an alternative. I, in all of Los Angeles, there, there, I guarantee there's some kind of alternative. You just got to yeah. put a little bit of effort to figure it out. And Can then you, once you do, it'll change your life. This is okay. So, this brings me to my question because you brought up Uber and Lyft. I am having a hard time understanding how that solves the problem because it's more cars on the road. Yeah, no, you're. You're absolutely correct, and actually, you. Uh, you're, uh, you like that. She, 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 she likes keep, yeah. She's, She might have us on more shows. All we do, little sound bites. I say, uh, you're correct. Thank you. Gwen is you're great. Correct. Gwen is great. Great. Gwen is great. I mean, um, it works for me. It, it's good. Uh, there was an article that came out yesterday in the San Francisco Gate or San Francisco Chronicle that said between the years 2010 and 2019 that Uber and Lyft caused an increase of congestion slash traffic rise uh, on the streets of San Francisco by 62%. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's studies out there that say, that back up what you just said. Yes, they have caused a lot more congestion on our roads. You know, a lot of people say, well, that's because of our economy is better. That's because people want to go into downtowns. There's a lot of other reasons why that happens. It goes to the first mile, last mile pro. Where I advocate for Uber and Lyft is really what a company like Via is is partnering with LA Metro. Use it as a first mile, last mile option. If you don't want to ride a scooter, if you don't want to ride a bicycle, use it to get to a transit stop or to a bus stop or to whatever. So then you could go and not have to pay as much Uber. I mean, if I went from my house in Manhattan Beach to downtown Los Angeles, it would cost... $30 $30 in an Uber and Lyft. To go from, from to take a Lyft to where the bus stop is, where the train stop is, because I only live a mile and a half, it's about three fifty or, or $4. And then I get on the bus and it's two bucks and 50 cents. So use, use it in that aspect as a first mile, last mile solution until, you know, they come up with these other alternatives. That's what I advocate I see. for. Okay. This, can I, it, going back to a question I asked earlier, maybe didn't wasn't clear about why I was asking. 
you're saying it's it's not up to the city. It's not there. There are not resources to to get the word out that there are these other transportation modes. That there are alternative transportation modes that are cheaper, more effective, give you more freedom on a personal, even on a on a productivity level. But it is in the interest of the cities. I feel in the counties. Maybe I'm wrong to have people actually buy into these systems. So it's great that you're willing to advocate personally and because it dovetails with the work you do. But ultimately, why why is this not being added to the sort of like cost inventory for cities and counties and states to get people to buy into their infrastructure to get the word out? Well, to, you, your point is a very good one. It's very, very fair. And I was thinking Thank about you. I was thinking about this. <laughs> I was thinking about what you're saying and I was thinking about here, here's here's where a little bit of my bias is coming from. Yeah. From my point of view, they are already advertising it. But to take your point into consideration, you want to know where they're advertising it? They're actually advertising it on the trains and buses themselves. Where there is already oh. you're right. So the, so there's so you're 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 correct. There's a problem. I, I'm seeing more. I'm seeing more dollars going into marketing. I'm seeing some things outside of the, the normal. I see billboards. I see some things, but a lot of local government has marketing problems. Which, which is crazy because these days of social media and, and, and millennials wanting to have a positive impact and all that type of stuff, local governments do have a marketing problem. I totally agree with you. And I guess as, as somebody who works on behalf of and for local governments, I almost feel like we, I'm an extension of the local governments because I do work for a lot of these transportation systems. And so, but I, but you're, you're describing as an extension, you're still describing your efforts as the efforts of a citizen. Not, correct. Not, you're right. Uh, you're not deploying a marketing budget you're right you, um, you know what they you know I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna raise this with them this is uh the next time they they allow me to speak freely which uh, it's a very dangerous thing for me to do uh, i'm gonna bring that up I, I think it's a it's i think it's a very good point but there are some really hard working government officials that that say the same message that i do that are going on to the podcast that are going on to these to these conferences but here's the problem they're talking already to people that have it, a vested interest in using these transportation offsets. So one of the reasons why I went on to the Wisco Weekly podcast, which by the way, before I got heavily involved with it, was a podcast solely, fo- primarily focused on the car buying and auto dealer experience, okay? So I was like, okay, here's people that are really interested in cars and like buying cars. Maybe I can infect them and try to re- have them rethink transportation like how they get around and, and and it's happened like that the podcast has evolved to not just focused on the automotive but now we're focusing on a whole bunch of other transportation alternatives so the problem that you're identifying and I, and I admit to is the echo chamber people are not taking time to go speak to people th- that are uh, of the opposite view or the opposite interest of them that's the hard part or just indifferent you know, or or just, different. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. You're absolutely that, but that's. I think that's a, probably a big part of human nature. But I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to go to any anybody that wants me to talk about this topic. I'm willing to talk about it. And and you're right. Local government should do that too. Uh, they could probably just use some help with ad buying. Uh, yeah, you're un- probably right. Identifying. Uh, sorry, Gwen. I didn't mean to get us off track. No, I just love all the logistics. This is an extension of the Californian sketch, just with a slightly more <laughs> philosophical bent. It is, it's, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, re- it really, it, it really, really is. Well, I mean, in one of our, um, in one of the philosophy classes, we'll talk about whether or not you have free will, and so I love that topic. You thought, like, so I am, I, I, am I am fascinated by that topic. I could, I, we don't have enough time to talk yeah. about that, but well, that, but that's a theme in a lot of my writings. Well, knowing that I'm com- that I was coming in here, I started to look. One of the last lectures was on determinism, which is essentially the argument that we do not have free will. And I couldn't help but think about the infrastructure project because just this notion that there is only one way, or if somebody really loves their car, it is in part because that is the environment. That's that's the the causal factor for that belief can easily be traced to the environment in which you live, which it wouldn't mean that, oh, I just love cars. No, you are in a place where you where that is a product where that is a very big way of life. It is the oh, but it, before we even built out this tran- the transit system that we started building out in 1980, it was the only option for a yeah. number of years. So your point is a great one. Like, thank you. Uh, you didn't you didn't <laughs> you didn't have a choice. So you might as well fall in love with what you got. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the thing. I, well, what I'm interested love the in one as well. You're with. Isn't that, isn't that a, isn't yeah, that a, when the eagle awesome. flies with the dove, yeah, 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 can't yeah. be with the one you love, honey. <laughs> 
That's good. <laughs> yeah. It's good, right? I'm not bring even looking. Cla- I like classic looking. rock, right? I bring it right into there. It's so, a terrible message, by the way. Horrible. By yeah. oh, I could go on for hours about how that. Uh, is it terrible? Is no, There's no positivity? It's pretty bad. It's basically saying if you're in a long distance relationship, this, uh, have sex with your neighbor. <laughs> I guess I didn't read it that way. Yeah. I mean, maybe I need Love to... the one you're with. It's a logistic. It, it does come down to logistics. <laughs> uh, it is. Trans- well, that's transportation. We are, I was still on topic. Okay, all right. We're Sorry on topic. about that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> Not on point, but on topic. <laughs> okay. Well, for um, for people to have a shift in thinking, it seems like there really is going to be an impact in their lives. You've mentioned when it hits people in their wallet. Um, I'm wondering, we've talked a little bit about time, about well, even health benefits to getting out of the car. One last thing I think I want to touch on is what about things like clean energy or what about the environment? What kind of a role does that play in the discussion about shifting our understanding of infrastructure? Uh, it, a, a fantastic question. Once she's again, Gwen, say, she's really you. good. I want to hear. I love the way she says thank you. Yeah. It's, it's just it's, I it's could almost feel it's like her a pat. getting close to the microphone. It's, it's, like a, it's like a pat on the shoulder. Yeah. So when my father immigrated here in the 1960s, um, he didn't know that, and he lived in downtown LA. Uh, he didn't know that there were mountains like just a couple of miles away because it was black. Outside, oh, wow. and, and then and then it and then in the seventies it became brown. And this is a true story, I swear. Where and I grew up in Fullerton. You were around La Habra, weren't you? Where you where you grew I was up? In more Placentia. Yeah. Placentia oh, area. Okay. <laughs> she looked. You really looked nervous about answering <laughs> that. Yeah, she did. She did. Yeah. Don't worry, I don't, I don't actually know where you live. She okay. looked kind of scared there. Yeah. No, 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 he no, wasn't was asking thinking... for your exact address. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, in the mid. 90s like 94 I, I i walked outside of my house like sometime in the summer and i noticed that there you know the canyons like the um the the los coyotes like hills and canyons uh-huh. i didn't see those until the 1990s wow so where we grew up oh we had we had a lot of smog now when you look outside it's just, la is just friggin' beautiful especially after the long winter that we just had it's just nice and clean and there's snow on the mountains and the the future of transportation is clean Period. It, it it need there need to be more electric cars on the road. There just not just cars, electric vehicles, electric options, electric scooters, electric bikes. The future uh, should be electric because we've already seen the the damage that we've inflicted to our environment previously. So the, the future is electric. Here's the flip side to that whole thing, and we talked about this a little bit earlier. As of right now, electric vehicles, if they're purely electric, they don't they don't pay gas. And one of the primary modes of funding transportation projects throughout the entire country. In California, we have other alternatives as well to supplement this. But one of the primary modes is through the gas tax. Okay, If you have more and more and more electric vehicles, you're going to be paying less and less and less gas. So, And then our the, the infrastructure problem and gap that we already have in this country is not going to get fixed unless we come up with alternatives to rebuild our infrastructure. So as we're rolling out for more clean energy, we need to think of alternatives to fund our infrastructure projects like vehicle miles traveled where you actually pay per, per mile. I think it's critically important that we do that we do emphasize a clean future. We always got to think of okay, but what else do we need to do? What's how's that going to be affected? So we don't so we're not just sitting around in twenty years going, oh my god, there's no money to build anything, you know? And we're using the old roads and using the old ways of, of getting around. I think we've come to see the gas tax as a punitive thing, but it really what what you're talking about is the civic buy-in for infrastructure because ultimately unless we're all libertarians everyone i think to some extent agrees that there needs to be resources available for shared infrastructure 100 percent, i couldn't agree more with you um do you hear that <laughs> as, as it be, when i became a muni bond lawyer i really learned a lot about our taxes and we learned a lot about like the civic buy-in and like schools your property tax you own a house you pay property tax guess what uh, there's there's a school there if you if they if they if you vote for a bond measure and and the and the, they build a nice new school there and now parents want to go to that school cuz the school's rising guess what your property values rise so everything that you do all those taxes and everything sure are we overtaxed of course we're overtaxed of course we are i could, i could go on and on about the the the, the tax fixes that i that i see but there you do get something from that whether it's a whether it's a road whether it's a transit agency whether it's a junior college which i believe strongly firmly believe that junior colleges are going to be one of the major backbones as private universities continue to get more and more expensive and we have more admission scandals and and there's easier and cheaper ways to learn Community colleges are also funded from property taxes as well. So and the value of liberal arts education becomes more and more questionable 
I mean, people are going to be learning from podcasts. Right, I mean, yeah. we're like, we're three, we're, I mean, she's really a professor, but like, you know, I think in the future. <laughs> I'm really one. I yeah. just call myself one. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a fake It's one. a role play thing I do with my dog. <laughs> but no, no, you're right. It's people do need to start thinking differently about infrastructure and, and like how they actually use it on a day by day basis. And, you know, maybe it won't hurt as bad when you do pay those taxes. Well, one of the things, oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, two things. One is I was going to say you abandoned a line of inquiry that I thought was fascinating and seemed very much to the point that you had mentioned earlier wanting to talk about, which was the philosophical underpinnings, the notion of freedom and uh, yeah. fate versus free will. But I also have a card that's about to get a yeah, ticket. Yeah, you need to. I can add some time but uh, and then come back. Okay. I don't know. Can if... we pause this? Yeah, probably. <laughs> Absolutely. Probably. <laughs> And, and so you, you're saying you had a profound thing happen to you while you're putting cash into the the, the beer? Even before. <laughs> oh, my God. Even before that. Oh, thank you. We briefly turned off the recording, I think prematurely, because I was talking about putting money in the meter, and it seemed not germane to this conversation. But in reality, the subject is, at least where we left off, was the notion of the freedom uh, afforded by the car, that being a mythology, uh, a toxic mythology. And I realized... I'm not free to continue this conversation for more than another 20 minutes now. And I was obligated to run down and put money in the meter. It's a great example of uh, the way that the car is confining and car culture is. Uh, and, and, and these are things that don't even occur. I didn't even occur to me. Didn't even uh, just right over my head. But because it's so deeply ingrained that, you know, you have to go. You're, you're tethered to your vehicle in some ways. I feel um, that way in line at the DMV. Can I, wait, I think Rudy was going to say that oh, was a good no, point. No, <laughs> I, I feel I'm like gonna, maybe. I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to raise. Oh, that was. Oh, that was I'm not going to get a gratification. Was, I'm going to get. You're going to one up me. That was profound. Oh, uh, what you just said was extreme. I didn't even think about how tethered and how constricting the vehicle is until you. There's a real life example. Yeah, we were right in the middle of a conversation. Didn't even see it. You couldn't put more money into the meter because it had a maximum amount and you had to leave a beautiful conversation run down there and then it only gave you 20 more minutes only 20 more minutes because at three o'clock i have to just leave the neighborhood the and, and, and i'm by, being and by bullied the way, by the system you should be down there by like 259 because they have tow trucks waiting at three. Oh man okay so just not to scare you no. but but just to just to drive home the point of how unfreedom the like the 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 car is it is very unfreedom it is it's anti-american <laughs> the car is anti-american see that's the campaign that the city needs to get behind they need to buy in the right place not on buses already populated wow. by people who take the buses this is why i've taken improv classes this is why i've taken stand-up classes this is why i've taken some acting classes everything you have done me. has brought you to this to hear, moment they, I want to be the spokesperson. You're like they Theon need to put Greyjoy. me. They need to put me onto the TV, and I need to be banging a drum or blowing up a car or doing something crazy. I agree with you. Do I you mean, hear that, cities? It's pretty wild. Well, that that's one of my my overarching questions. Is that I know for I teach him an engineering ethics class, and one of the biggest things is that you know these engineers they are obliged to take an ethics class, and they don't understand why. They just care if something works or not. So engineers right. have souls. Yes, they do. I thought they just figured, <laughs> they they, oh, do. this works and it doesn't have a soul. Who cares? They do. I think they're well, shoving souls into them. That's <laughs> oh what's gosh. happening. Gwen okay. is shoving souls. Yeah. Gwen is a soul she's shover. Hired, she's a soul shover. I'm yeah. a soul such shover. A thing. I mean, it's, a good, it's, a good, it's a good term. So, um, you know, they're young and they're smart and they're thinking, we just want to know if something works. And engineering is just so objective. That's their thing. It's just, you know, math and science, it's objective. But then I always give the example of if you were to, there's engineers all over the world. And if you go all over the world, world buildings look different everything is different which means that it can't be that objective engineering can't be that objective if everywhere in the world looks different because that means every the way that everything is designed is a projection of some vision mm. and so that and brings of an me back underlying value system and way right. of approaching the world yes and so that's where i think the infrastructure question is really interesting because the way it is now is the result of a vision although southern california is changing la is changing and so we have a better idea about health about climate things like that freedom um that we need to design it to fit a different that it, it no longer it no longer fits that vision mm. or that value. Yeah, and that's tough to change to shift value system 
uh, is some is part of maturity. The culture yeah. is maturing just like your Especially engineering students are maturing out of their adolescent male fixation on absolutism. <laughs> okay. it, it's true. As, <laughs> as, was, as Gwen is shoving a soul down there. shoving a throat. soul. I mean, you know what? Can I put that on my syllabus? Do you yes. mind if I quote you? <laughs> With apologies. I'd sign up for that class. Yeah. I could use a soul. <laughs> Gwen is engineering on a higher level. You're engineering souls for engineering. <laughs> oh my God. She's godlike, yes. Gwen. <laughs> you feel that. She really is. How is that? I didn't hear a thank you when he said you were godlike. <laughs> sure. There was no thank you. That was the ultimate. Okay. <laughs> but what, but you bring up, uh, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm joking around, but I do recall the anxiety I felt as a teenage boy become, moving into that point in my life where I was supposed to be growing up, going to college, learning how to make my way in the world of men, it, because it was mid-90s, so it was the world of men still. The notion that there was something very comforting in knowing uh, whether something worked or didn't work. To you know, I, I remember having conversations with a friend of mine who was a, a physics major who was took it one step further and was saying math is... Uh, math is the only sort of holy language that all n human language is, is f uh, faulty and f it encodes all sorts of weird values and subjective. But math is this beautiful thing, you know, this beautiful language that's totally uh, can't be touched by subjectivity. Was that person like a really huge fan of the movie Contact? He that was, was how they a that paranoid was how the, the aliens. Oh yeah, it sounds yeah, that sounds yeah, about right. right. Aliens and Contact and math. Yeah, it, but there is there is a beauty to it, and there's a kind of uh, an elegant. I think that that folks that are drawn to physics and engineering to some extent find it, there's something it, pure supposedly about it. Here's my I problem see. with it. Yeah. I got a major problem with it. Okay, my wife is brilliant mathematician. She's great at mathematician. You want to know what she's not good at? Bullshitting. And my problem with math is I'm a I'm very bad at math because you can't BS math. Like I can't argue around math. So I'm a horrible I'm horrible at math. Like I look at it, I'm like no, this is so absolute. There's no gray. Like, there's no, like... It's inhuman. It's inhuman. There's no soul in math. That's my problem with math. And I think that's exactly the... I, sorry, I mean, well, we're I psychoanalyzing think... your engineering students. No, They're no, probably no. having panic attacks. <laughs> They're full of they hate are. right I now, think that, for sure. I yeah. think that the assumption is when we say, okay, such and such is objective, that you still have that problem that it's still... Whatever is understood mathematically or scientific um, endeavors, it is still a result of someone's point of view saying, I want to invest in that. Right. So even though then when someone understands it, it can be put in math or science in order for everybody else to understand because it's the same language. The fact that something is discovered in the first place is because somebody cared. So like, let's just say a cure for, for a particular kind of a disease that is then understood mathematically scientifically but let's just say the reason that it was understood or the reason that it was discovered in the first place is because somebody's let's say family member passed away from it so then they decided to invest in that so i think that math and science of course they they're objective but i think that once you take it outside of the human realm we're still losing something some understanding if i may hmm. i remember again to return to young Jacob in college uh, having a, a panic attack when a, a, a friend of a friend came up and said, did you know that by 2019, maybe is when he said, I don't know, uh, computer algorithms will have either been able, they will have invented every great work of art. They will have uh, rediscovered. And I remember thinking, that sounds wrong. It, it, it can't be. And then I was sort of wondering whether it was just some sort of uh, human narcissism that made me but I realized at a certain point the only reason great art is great art the only reason like you're saying a disease is identified and we want to cure it the only reason why we care about infrastructure is that it facilitates hum humanity yeah. so you've still got that that deliverables problem uh, you're still delivering or that communication problem or whatever it is you're still we're still human beings all of us except for engineers yeah, I know good, they're going to listen to this they they my engineers are the sweetest. I, I, no, I'm sure I, they engin are. Engineers, I engineers need to be superhuman for the things that they're building. I mean, if you really, if you want to see something that's superhuman, if you're on the 110 freeway where the 105 is, and you're and you're you're riding up on the overpass, and you're just seeing how high up you are, and all these cars, millions, these cars by the numbers a year, millions pass through them, and they stand up. To t I mean. It's Engineers amazing. are superhuman. I'm, I'm glad they don't have souls. I'm glad they're there to, <laughs> to keep us safe. Well, it sounds like Gwen's in the business, among other things, of bringing the human to the superhuman. 
I mean, that's the thing. That's that, why I support her. Yeah, <laughs> I do. She's, well, you know, this is something about AI, something that freaked me out that I just learned where this isn't quite like the art thing, but for a long time, AI could not beat the game of Go. Um, the game of Go, the... Go Fish? No, 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 oh. no. It's the... I want to say it's... Shit. I don't know. I think it's Chinese. The it's a game of it's a game of go. Um, it's a board that's much larger than a chess game, and it's just two stones. They will play for hours. So it's it's a different type of a board game, and it has so many different possibilities that they could not get get an AI that could beat um, any player, as opposed to let's say a chess player. You can get AI to do that, and well, so for a long time. A yeah, but for a long time, the game of Go seemed to be the marker of the distinction between human intelligence and AI. AI can now beat the best player at Go. And not only that, then they created another AI that can now beat that AI at the game of Go. It, that is, for me, that made my heart sink. Just lock those two AIs in the room and <laughs> yes. let them duke it out. Well, so it's, it, uh, yeah, I mean, we keep defining things that we consider human that, that delineate us from other forms of intelligence, primary yeah. animal intelligence. That's what gives us the right yeah. to eat them. But ultimately, at the end of the day, all those things disappear. It seems to be that the, the basic emotion and empathy are those things that we strive for that make us human that you're trying to... Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, I want to... Um, that was maybe... incredibly hubristic. I apologize you... <laughs> for just summing up what no, humanity no, no. is. I, was... I just well, saw Gwen looking nice at me. I wanted to cap the sentence. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> this is what human is. I do... Wait, this is this is kind of back to the infrastructure. This was just one little side note question that I have in here, and I don't quite know where it fits, but I can't help but ask... When we were trying in LA to figure out what to do with traffic and then the carpool lane was created, what happened there? Does it not work? What kind Car of a solution was that? The carpool lane was a, a one way to entice drivers uh, to, it was ride sharing. Like, you know, one way to, to, to um, carrot and stick kind of an approach. We're going we're gonna to eliminate an entire lane of, of the highway and we're going to give it to people who ride together. You know, because there's too many single occupant vehicles out there. The problem with the carpal lane is is just another problem that you just keep seeing happening over and over again. There was a study that just came out this week, or was it last week, that said bi literally billions of dollars were spent, you know, with the Carmageddon and the expanding of the 405 oh, yeah. freeway, and they thought that that was going to help with traffic flow. It just made traffic flow worse. So if you expand the roads, if you just keep w focusing solely on roads, people will use those roads more. Carpool lane, you know, now now we're now we've kind of shifted over to express lanes, whereby as a single occupant, I can pay a toll and I can use a carpool lane. I, I pay a, a ridiculous amount of money to use that, but it yes, because I have the means to do that, I use it. But a, a lot of times, I will try to get somebody in my car with me more often than not because I'm like, oh, okay, great, I could ride the the express lanes for free. So it does kind of reward that's that what ride blow up sharing. dolls are for, by the way. Oh yeah, that Just they saying. they did that in it's Jersey. One of the things they're for. They they did do that's that in Jersey. The they did. They, they, they yeah, If you if you drive around with that, it's a it's a it's a big fine. But oh man, you know, car, the the problem there, Gwen, is still the overfocus on 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 roads. You, yeah. need, you need to you need to build alternatives, and the alternatives are transit systems are you know designated bus lanes micro mobility lanes and you know to be perfectly honest with you flying cars there that's going to be that's going to be here within the next 10 years guaranteed like nobody is laugh a couple years ago when i said that people would laugh nobody's laughing about that anymore it's going to happen and then that's interesting because it's above ground like what infrastructure do we really need in my opinion and some people out there think we'll see flying cars more flying cars out there, quote unquote, uh, before we see a massive adoption of uh, uh, the connected autonomous vehicles. Because with connected autonomous vehicles, you got to redo the infrastructure. With flying cars, you know, there's no infrastructure in the air. There's buildings and there's FAA rules and there's coordination. But I, I do think that the future of tra of travel and transportation and commuting is in some kind of hybrid plane car vehicle. It makes you're, sense. You're picturing yourself that. in the car. I, you can see that look on that wistful. You're like, uh, I want a flying car. Well, what I'm thinking is the motivation and the mythology is there. The car companies are still doing a better job get messaging and getting the their their mythos out there. And so, you know, I, I have a couple drones. I'm I'm not gonna lie. The image of you know that they're fun. 
so that you can already picture all the all the sales angles to getting people to buy into uh, flying cars. They're very similar to those of the car: fun, freedom, all these things that are not yet associated with other forms of infrastructure and transportation. Even though, arguably, like you've said, it sounds like you're doing a great job getting the word out, but you're just one man. Yeah. I'm, I'm one man, but I'm here with a team of people, yeah, and I, I appreciate this opportunity to get the, the message out. One message that I, I have to get out is it's it's 2.56, and if you're not down there by 3 o'clock, your car is going to be towed. Oh, no. I, okay, I we'll think that's the most beautiful meta point. <laughs> that goes right to the heart of everything. right to the heart of the arguing. problem. Yeah. That, that's, okay, right, that's, right, that, that's right here. <laughs> okay. Uh, but Let's wrap it up. So thank you so much. I also have to <laughs> sh- say a thank you to my intern, Karina, for uh, her research on this. And thank yeah. You, Karina. Thank you, Karina. And thank you, Gwen. And thank you for amazing things that uh, we discussed today. And that profound, you, you, you're like the guinea pig of this entire podcast of why cars don't necessarily equal freedom. There it is. There we go. Next time, I'm Gadfly and guinea pig, Jimmy Weber. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> yes. All right, bye. Godspeed. <laughs>